Connected, the podcast. I am so excited you guys are here. Listen, people, there are so many conversations being had out there about unplanned pregnancy, right? So many opinions, so many agendas, but there are no conversations being had like the ones we're having right here. You know how I know? Because these conversations are telling the truth. The truth as it is told in two ways. First, the truth of my own personal story as told in my autobiography. You are not disqualified reclaiming the God's promises in your unplanned pregnancy and the truth about who you are as told by the word of God. In the following episodes, you will hear from women just like me who have experienced the realities of unplanned pregnancy in all different situations from all different backgrounds experiencing the same feelings. The intention in having these conversations on a public platform is to have these conversations on a public platform. We believe that faith comes by hearing. And so we encourage you to listen to Life Unexpected podcast with the expectation that it will bring you faith in your situation today. And today we will be hearing from Kelly. Hi, I'm so excited to be joining you today. And we're going to be focusing on chapter seven, my Jesus. I have to say that one of the things that are a passion for me is understanding that we're purposed by God from design, um, from conception to design. And so this story is a part of my story, as well as sharing some highlights from chapter seven as we go forward. So we're just going to um, just jump right in. So one of the things we're going to read through some of passages in the chapter, what stood out to me immediately was um, talking about, let me tell you about my Jesus. And so understanding that our relationship with Christ is core to everything that we do. So in chapter seven, it says, as you are right now, you are a child of God, which means you are guaranteed some incredible promises. And these promises are an eternal covenant between you and God. That settled for me, my understanding that I matter and, and, and it's important what happens in my life, how I connect, but there are promises that are attached to being a child of God and that it's personal. So he ordained that I would come into the earth. Even our children would come into the earth with purpose and with destiny. And that's an eternal covenant between us and God. So between every person that's created and God, there's an eternal promise. We can find those promises in the scripture. And when you look at um, statements like I will <clears throat> is a covenant promise. I will um, by myself, I have ordained these specific things. So God gives us promises that are are for us. So as I begin to think about that, I thought about my life and my journey in becoming a mom. And so my life started in traditional family, growing up in the Bay Area, oldest of three daughters, oldest of th three daughters, but I'm the oldest. And in my life trajectory, I had a plan. And that plan was what I thought, this is how everything will come out. And then God had a plan. And so knowing that God had a plan for my life, I could trust my relationship with him as I move forward. Now, God's plan was not my plan. My plan was to go to college, get married, have children, live happily ever after. That wasn't the picture. <laughs> so God's plan was to keep centering me as his daughter knowing that he has fulfilled promises for me to fulfill because he created me with a purpose. Outside of anything else that came in my life, I knew God created me with a purpose. And that purpose is what he wanted to fulfill in my life. Sometimes our purposes are fulfilled in different ways. So in chapter seven, I was really drawn by the story about being removed from what I had as a trajectory and even my fears, right? 
the fears of not being enough, the fears of being dropped or discarded, the fears of being living in sin and having things happen in my life that drew me to one direction. And where we would give up on ourselves, God says, no, I still have my promises and I still have my covenant. And they stand no matter what we do, what we say, what life brings at us. God's promises are sure. His covenant promises are for every individual. And that's ourselves and our children. And I keep saying that because sometimes as moms, we believe that it's all our responsibility, how we eat, what our health is how our children come into the world <clears throat> and what we have a part in that. But what we don't understand is that every seed, every promise of God comes into the world at the Pacific time and the destiny that they need to be here to do the work that's assigned to them. And while we love our children, while we understand that we're fallible, God is not and his promises are not. And so as we move forward, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to really foster the promises of God and the covenant promises of God on ourselves, as well as our children as we um, move forward. So back to my story. So I was married at 17, a little young, but at 17 was married. And I had this ideal picture of what marriage would be like and all of these wonderful things. But what I didn't understand is that all of us have humanity of life, right? And we are a co- we are combinations of the lives that we have lived, our childhood, our experiences. And while we may have good intentions, some of those things may get in the way for us being what that dream idea was. So my world was rocked. I was married for 11 years. I did not get pregnant in my marriage, but I got exposed to a lot of abuse and things like that. And so in the time where I thought, God, I know what you promised. I know what you said. I'm going to stand on your promises. My whole life unfolded. And so in that life unfolded, it it was a part of a move to a new state all by myself, leaving all my family behind, all my work behind, still not satisfied still not receiving the promise of bearing children, moving to the new state, and then everything falling apart, getting divorced, being betrayed, it coming to the forefront. And so it left me at a place, I always say that I was in this owl of um, Patmos, and I was so distraught. And I remember distinctly, I had this um, dental thing going on, And it was like, as I was taking in all of those things in my body and my mind and my emotions and feeling totally depleted, suicidal, I was also going through this dental thing. And as I went through this process, I remember writing it in my journal. And as I journaled it out, it broke. And so when that broke, also my understanding and my clarity broke as well. And so God began that restoration process from that point. So as I'm going through this process, homeless, living with some friends in a new state, no family, nobody around, God told me to remember the promises that he gave me. And he said that you would be able to worship me at your heart's content with no traditional bondages and all those things. And you will fulfill and you will be a mom. And I was like, God, how can I be a mom? Like, just got divorced. I do have a standard that I want to live by. I don't see anybody floating in to capture me. I'm broken. I'm wounded. I need deliverance. All of these things. He's like, stand on my promises. I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, so 11 years of marriage failed. And I encountered these young, this, these women, they were young at heart, older women. I was telling them my story and I was like, I've wasted 11 years. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. That's experience. And so when they gave me that nugget, I reframed 11 years of what I had did in my own strength to an experience. And I said it was field practice. So consider every experience that you had that didn't go the way that you wanted to go. All of it counts towards practice experience to get you to where God intends for you to be. So in this practice, what I understood very, very quickly, was that in order for me to move to the next place, I needed to be whole and I needed to be complete. 
And I needed to stay standing on what God's principles were. So I started to write and dream and journal again. I got a little journal and I began to write out the promises that God had for my children, really listening to Holy Spirit to tell me like who they would be, what it would be like. And right in that moment, I wasn't even married. I was divorced, still broken, still wounded, still hurt, very, very angry, layers and layers and layers of things going on. But I began to write this story. And so as I'm going through this story in in chapter seven, it begins to talk about how within that mess of pain, God showed me the roots of the pain that abortion had managed to settle in me. While I had never conceived a child, but for me, what that process was, was being rejected, was being cast aside was being said that I wasn't enough and thinking that it was all my fault. And so God showed me that the roots of that pain that I had been carrying, emotional abuse, um, domestic violence, that all of that had managed to settle in me where I, one, didn't have any expectation for life. And I just kind of floated through. So I'm here, I'm in meetings, I'm talking, I'm serving in the church but I'm totally numb. And so I had resolved that even though God had promised me that there's no way this is going to be possible, I'm just going to be alone and lonely and living and serving and doing all these things. But little did I know that at the same point that I was going through my process and deliverance, my husband, who I'm married to now, was also going through a process of deliverance. And so what happened is I began to identify that that source of pain that I had was not my responsibility, that I was able to ask God to remove it and to bring forth the promises because I I actually said, God, you said, and I got really, really kind of haughty with it. Like, God, you said you would bring me here. You said I would have peace. You said I would have my family. And I began to just really, really, it was really an anger to be honest, but To start, it was like, I'm reminding you of your promises and your covenant promises. And so I literally wrote out the covenant promises of God for myself, for my children, for my husband to be, for my life. And I began to write out, write out all of those promises. So what, what I understand now, and I get teary in this, my activation of writing out those promises and holding God true to his word was my act of obedience. I never imagined that it would come to pass. Never imagined it would come to pass. But today, I'm living in those promises. And so as God did those that work in the chapter, she talks about, he uprooted the source of triggers and heartache that kept me blocked off from relationship. He wanted to be with me. And I'm reminded of being, um, coming forward a little bit. I got a Habitat for Humanity home, had no furniture. I had a pot, a pan, a plate, a fork that I bought at Goodwill. And I would go home to that emptiness and be even more empty. And so I didn't want to go home because I was like, it's just going to be me and I'll be alone. And I remember crying in the living room on the floor. And just crying out to God, like, God, this is this is not for me. I'm not meant to be by myself. I want to serve. I want to be loved. I want to be with someone. And God said very, very clearly, he's like, Kelly, can I have you to myself for just this little bit? And I thought, you want to be with me? You want to be with me? I'm a mess. He's like, I just want you for my my own like time and fellowship just for a little bit. And I thought a God that loves you that much wants to be with you. What does he have to say important to me? So from that moment, I started to spend quiet time with God and prayer and devotion because it was just me. Right. I could focus totally on God. But in those times of sitting with him and in devotion, just sitting, listening, writing and journaling, he began to rebuild 
that dream, that idea that I, I had and what he wanted to fulfill in my life. And what he created in that moment was that there was hope and there was a purpose that I was to fulfill. So life continued to go on. And we think about the unexpected things of life, but life continued to go on. And I was working at school during my work. And I was also a new person came into the building who would be my husband. I didn't know it would be my husband. And so he was broken and we were at church one Sunday and we were praying for the men in the cave of Abdulin. So if you read that story, the men had retreated. They were in the cave hiding out and the people began to pray that they would come forth. So we were simulating that Pacific passage and I began to pray. I'm not thinking I'm praying my husband, right, to come forth because I have this knight in shining armor. I'm going to be rescued. He'll come on the horse and everything will be wonderful, right? So no, <laughs> that wasn't the story. So I'm praying and life is continuing and he comes to my building and he's taking care of our building and whatnot. And so he's looking at me, not in the image, because my image of who I was was not what he was drawn to, nor was I drawn to him. Like he was not, he was far from what I would be appealed to. And so, but we both had these prayers that God would bring us fulfillment, that we would be aligned with what God has for us to do. And so he's coming around, he's talking and whatnot. My walls are still big, like brick walls with cement way up, not very nice, and so he's like, well, I care for you. I was like, who told you to care for me? Don't be caring for me. Like, go away, and <laughs> clean my space and go away. And he's like, well, I already told my God, like, like this is my wife. I was like, and who, can, how can you talk to my God about me? Like, you don't even have the same God as me. I'm like, so, so, so mean. But that was hurt, right? And wounds that I had. And so as I'm going through this process, God is showing me what I desire and what's coming forth. But he says, most of all, you are safe and you are protected and you don't have to be afraid. Because my idea of men at this time was not very good. I wanted to keep them out, not let them in at all, because you will hurt me, you'll abuse me, and I don't, I'm not, I don't have anything for it. Yet I was still believing for the promise of my children to come forth. And so, long story short, we um started, he started coming to church. And it was a very short span of time, right? And so what I remembered was that what I had asked God, what I had listed, and everything that I had said. And so God brought him forth into my life. So fast forward, we get married. And um, I get pregnant. I didn't think I could get pregnant because 11 years, I had never gotten pregnant. And so I get pregnant. And um, then I have a miscarriage. That loss was most devastating loss, but I knew that there was a possibility now. There was a hope, right? So we did all the things we needed to do, um, natural, up to the point of in vitro fertilization, which didn't happen because then I got pregnant again after the miscarriage. Five years after the miscarriage, then I got pregnant. This promise comes forth. In 2007, I birthed my first son. 2009, I get a bonus son that we weren't expecting, but I have both of those boys live, living, doing amazing things because of the promises that God said and standing on those promises. What I know for sure in my capacity as a mom, because I have waited for so long and I'm 40, I'm 40 years old with this first child, 42 with the second one. Everyone around me has children. I'm in the field of education, teaching children, teaching teachers, teaching parents, and I'm not a parent. And it was so devastating because I desired it so much. But God had a timing for their lives to come forth. He had a timing for my life. But most of all, he wanted me to be restored. He wanted me to be delivered. And he wanted me to be in wholeness. So in that time of waiting that seemed so long, what God did is he healed my husband and I, our, our past. He healed our addictions. He healed all of the things that would hinder the birth from coming, but also the things that would hinder the fullness of life for their lives. 
So today they're 15 and 13 years old, thriving young men, young prophets of God, living their life according to what God has planned with us as parents, getting to come alongside on the journey. So one of the things I know for sure is that every parent is assigned to the child that you birth, that you adopt, that you foster, that comes into your being because there's something in you that is needed to fulfill the destiny that's in them. And in that purpose, what happens is we get to, I say, come alongside our children. And I know this is against lots of things traditionally we've been told. But every person is a creation of God, and they have a destiny. They're not our possessions. They're not our trophies. They're not our dolls to be dressed up and to do all these things. They are God's children, purpose and destiny for such a time as this. And this is when they were coming forth. So even though sometimes children come forth in very, very dire circumstances, God ordained them to be here. We were fearfully and wonderfully made in our mother's womb. In the moment of not even the thought, when God decided to drop the seed, to fertilize it and start it growing, he had a plan for what that looks like. Our purpose is to get with God on what is that plan and then align it to what the promises of God are. So I challenge you to really look at one, what have you promised? What has God promised you? What are those covenant promises? And what did you ask of him? Because he hears us. He says, ask, seek and knock. And he hears us and he opens the door And he begins to align some things because sometimes we get stuck in the day to day and we forget that there were promises that he made. There was covenant that he made and he wants us to stand on that promise. So I am so excited that this is going to unfold and God is going to connect some things in you and in your children and that this generation will change the world. That's a prophecy. I prophesy over my boys from conception you will be the generation that changes the world. The words we speak matter, what you say and think matters. And today you have an opportunity to choose Christ and to move forward in his purpose. And so I invite you to keep on following this work. Follow me as well. Look for our new product, um, A to Z Parenting Community membership that comes out in January. And also, I invite you to the launch pad, which will be in 2023, to get a vision for your life, for your children, and for the promises that God has. And so, God bless you. Wow, Kelly, thank you so much. It was, this was so powerful. I, I got so many takeaways. I don't even know where to start. But uh, I just okay. want to say thank you for you know having the courage to come forward and share your story. First and foremost, um, we have so many similarities in our story, and I didn't even know that. <laughs> so again, right? Everything on purpose, everything yeah. with a plan. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna dive right in because what's really pulling me is um, I love that you used the, the term field practice. Like it was all mm-hmm. field practice, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm I'm going into the space of um, our listeners who for the most part are um, in the place of conceiving unexpectedly, right? And now either have already made their decision to move forward or trying to make a decision, right? Mm-hmm. To carry the baby or not. Um, and I remember being in that space of, um, you know, I feel like understanding that it's all field practice is in hindsight, mm-hmm. right? But when you're in it, Mm-hmm. To say, but wait, I'm not, I'm I'm just so young. I don't have enough life experience, but wait, what about, I got to finish my, my degree. I got to fit. That was my series, right? I got to finish my, I got to have enough money. Wait, I got to get married first. Like I need more field practice. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But standing, I love, you know, that connection with the field practice and the covenant standing firm exactly where you are, and where he's brought you in that moment of conception to say the field practice that you have up until this point is enough. Yes. Right. Yeah. And how do we, um, I guess really it's just the blind faith in the covenant, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, before you 
met your husband and that mm-hmm. time period and these, I love the, these angry prayers, right? Of like, but you said, you said, <laughs> like we can all as, as right believers, I, I've been, I was praying them yesterday. You said, <laughs> okay. is it, right? So that, that understanding that you're all up in the field practice stage of it, but at the same time, we're, we're given these responsibilities of, I guess, really acting as if, mm-hmm. and, and the faith that it requires to, um, you know, you said it, I believe it and keep stepping forward when nothing looks like it. So I'd like to like hear a little bit more about that time period in your life um, when you were in the field practice, right? Yeah. So, so in that, in that field practice time, so I didn't recognize it as field practice. I was, I was distraught. Like I've wasted my life. Right. But knowing the voice of those elders who I didn't know all of their experiences, but the wisdom of the women in my life, knowing like what they said mattered, that gave me a new perspective and framework. And so I started to, first I started to say it as field practice, even though I didn't feel it. But then I started to actually examine it. And I examined it in the way when I was in my first marriage as a wife, I was all in, all the way in that I lost my own identity. And so I was so much being in my roles that I forgot who Kelly was and that I was ordained by God to live a purpose, right? So I talk about that in my um, anthology, Loving and Living Through Tragedy. And so in that loss of my identity, their words of field practice gave me permission to go back and one, connect with what is it that I want to do and what does that look like? And to explore and try, try things because I was very traditional in that you go to school, you go to college, you get married, you have children, you, um, you have children for your parents so they can be a grandparent. Right. So still not fulfillment in myself. And so what it taught me was that these are learned women who have fulfillment who understand that everything in life happens and it matters for a reason. And we need to take advantage of that. So I began to tell my story. I began to get my voice. I began to change the narrative that was running in my head because I thought it was a waste of a wasted life, but no, it was field practice. So I learned some things I can bring forward into what I imagine my life to be. So it gave me a a bridge to bridge the things that I want to have in my life, have some hope, think back to what God's promises were and re-anchor that piece of it. The other piece that I learned as a parent, and I learned this twofold in my field in education in working um, with children and families, is that children don't come with a roadmap. So you have to trust both the children and yourself to navigate this together. And so I teach about that in my field, in my practice, and in my work, and through A to Z parenting, that children have developmental stages they will go through, but we also have parenting stages we go through. And it happens together. And one is not leading the other. One is relying on each other. And so in that field practice, even though you may not think you have all the tools that you need, when that baby comes and you're holding them in your arms, you innately begin to figure out some things. And the key is that you figure it out for what you need and the child needs, not for what the world and society has said you have to be or become. And so I tell parents all the time, settle in to what you want to create because that's what you're going to live in. There's nobody coming to your house at 4 a.m. when the baby is crying. It's only you and them. So get a system that works for the two of you and then move forward in that system. And it doesn't really matter what other people think because one, they're not funding anything. They're not coming to your house. And at the end of the day, this is your relationship with your child and yourself that has to be nurtured, right? And every time I say that, people laugh, but that's the truth. Like, cause you're going to get, you're pregnant, people trying to touch your belly. Like that's my personal body. <laughs> Please back up. 
Yeah. They're going to give you all kind of reasons why you need to do X, Y, Z. But end of the day, you have to be settled in what you choose. And it has to benefit the child so they can grow and develop and mature. So, yeah. <laughs> you also spoke about, you know, the indication of what that covenant is. Um, can be found in scripture with the two words, I will. I will. Yes. That's so good. Do you, I'm not putting you on the spot, <laughs> uh, but do you have any scripture that carried you through any of those seasons that you can remember anything you turned to or anything that any of the women in your life? Um, I, re- I remember the story of um, Abraham leaving his family mm-hmm. and that's, that's where I started to anchor um those I will scriptures. So I'm a researcher. So I will study out with the Strong's Concordance. And I would just say, go back to those base scriptures. I don't have a list of them, but go back to the base scriptures and look at, I always looked at the origin of that word. And so when he tells Abraham, I will make your name great. Right. Mm -hmm. And he talks about his generations. And so I began to anchor And actually, like, I don't have that Bible handy, but I began to highlight those covenant scriptures and covenant promises. And literally, I can see the page in my journal. I had a little paper journal with a stamped bear on it that I had colored. And it said covenant promises of God. And I did for each of my sons. And I and my and I even did for my daughter that I uh, miscarried. Joy was her name. Joy Elizabeth. Um, and so I did for each of them what their covenant promises were based on the word of God. And when I began to declare those things, it got into my spirit, right? But also when I began to see things that did not align, I was like, that's not the covenant promise of God. Mm-hmm. God, you said you will da 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 da. Right. And so when standing on those promises was a prominent part of getting me through those hard times and hard years. Mm -hmm. Because the other piece of that story, like I said, um, substance abuse, my husband, um, my current husband suffered with that. And getting through that period was critical when I actually knew, like, I know God, I can go through deliverance. I can take him through deliverance. We can do it together and we can stand and reestablish. And that was when... Like I knew for a fact, all of my understanding of the word and all those things wasn't just surface, but it had taken root and deep, deep root. And that was what we instilled in our boys. And still today, they are able to pray a prayer. They can um, tap into what God is saying, have sharp discernment because it was modeled, but it was also ingrained with those promises that we would um, speak over. So go back to the promises of Abraham, the covenant. If you look at the covenant um, in the Old Testament, the uh, um, Adamic covenant, Noah, and then Abraham, those core scriptures then track into the New Testament of those promises and also the book of Hebrews. So I studied the whole book of Hebrews during that time, very in-depth study. And that also was an anchor to increase in my faith as well. So good. That's so good. And and the covenant set with Abraham was the covenant set with David, was the covenant set, right? And and covenant set with us that there is, that is the origin and it hasn't changed, that God has it been. It hasn't changed. Consistent. And I put my name in there. And, yeah. And oh, I love that. I, yeah. yeah, I put my name in it as I was reading it out loud. And just recently I got back to this practice. And when I heard myself say, my, we say affirmations now, but really yeah. they're declarations, yes. right? When I heard it say out loud, I was like, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So mm-hmm. it's like in the scripture, you just build it on your most holy faith, right? Yeah. So sometimes we we don't build it up because we don't say it and speak it. It doesn't get in our ear gate. Yeah. And then when we do, we're charged it's just like the little girl, shark girl that's in the mirror, like, and I can do it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have all of the tools. That's so true. And we have the promises of God. We just need to speak it to yeah. quiet those other voices that are talking. And I love that you um, pulled out of that the tool of um, 
not only does it give us the charge and stand in our identity, but it also gives us the discernment between what does not align with that, right? And so if this is the first time for our listeners that you're even, who's Abraham, right? <laughs> We're going right. there, right? Who, what do you mean Abraham? Right. Um, and you're not familiar with, you know, the covenant, but you are, I know, I know that I know that I know that you are very familiar with what is out of alignment with that, yes. right? And yeah. if these things aren't manifesting and we can't hold on to something tangible in our life right now that aligns with the promises of God, you can definitely hold on to what is not, right? Yes. And that, I love that tool. So it goes both ways. And if you stand in those, you know, I am's, right? We said they're, they're affirmations, but these, you know, confirmations in our identity and, and it's not aligning with you, lean on, maybe you need to little, lean a little heavier on what is not, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. For today, until yeah. it does give you the charge because and, it and, and give yourself the space to create what you want mm. right in life we're told so much of who we have to be what we have to do right. why this is important but what resonates with your spirit right so god we're spirits and god created us to be in fellowship with him right and innately there's things that we have knowing about that activate us So I I always tell people I'm working with individually, like what brings you joy? So Mm -hmm. think about the last time you were smiling and laughing hilariously. What was that? What happened? And sometimes people will say, oh my God, I was playing with my child and he said the funniest thing and I was just connect. You were connecting with him, but you were connecting with a part of who you were, right? So when when I see my boys now walk, they play basketball and football. When I see them walk across the um, court, matter of fact, last night, my youngest, he had he had not been taking shots and he had been missing the shots that he did. So last night he's going and I saw him sitting with his coach before he did this. And he kind of pulled to his shirt like, yeah, I got that. I'm going yeah, in. I love it. And so he goes in and he takes a shot and he makes it. And so after that point, he's like, I can do every shot. So he mm-hmm. shoots. He only makes one. That's his first like two pointer in the whole season that just started. But his confidence was like, I'm invisible. I can do this. Right. And so that develops because one, he's told himself he's changed his narrative because we worked on that. Like, how do you see yourself performing in the game? We're going to win. We're going to. Even if they don't win, he already has a new narrative in his head. So when he comes back on the court, that's what he's coming into. Mm-hmm. So we have to take, especially as, as moms, we have to take what is a narrative I want to create for myself mm-hmm. and then see ourselves in that. Mm-hmm. So the Kelly today looks nothing like the Kelly who came from um, moving from one state to another, getting divorced. Right. She was defeated. Her clothes, everything was defeated. Like, But when I look at myself today, I'm like, oh, my God, God, you did this. You did this thing because it wasn't in my own strength, Mm -hmm. but it was me standing up in those promises. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just writing it down, putting it in a book, but it was standing up in the promises. So when the child comes and I don't know what to do, I'm like, God, you said, right? Right. And I, I literally used to my oldest, I used to say, good morning, um, his name, um, mighty man of valor, mover and a shaker, Oof. prophet of the Lord. And I would speak these things over him every single morning. And he would just smile because kids <laughs> don't know like what you're saying. He just smiled and he would take it all in. Yeah. But my goddaughter who was watching me, she was young and she uh, she she told her teacher because her teacher said, how did you get so smart? And she said, my Gami, which she calls me godmother, but it's Gami. She said, my Gami told my mom to play this music, which was classical music, because it strengthens the brain connection. Mm -hmm. And so she said, my Gami told me my mom to play this music. And she did. And it made me really, really smart, like my brother. And he he has a long name, but she te- she calls his name every morning. So she thought That's all funny. of that was his name. I love that. Oh my gosh. I love but that. she's like, here this like five-year-old is watching yeah. this interaction, yeah. taking it in. And here she is in second grade explaining to her teacher what this is, right? 
And so we think like, we're just moving through. We just say these little things, but it's taking root. And those are the promises that we stand on for fulfillment of what God has said. So, so you said taking root and that brings me to what the next thing I was going to talk about. So, um, I have an experience, my first marriage, I experienced domestic violence as well. I have a history of substance abuse. I was married to an addict, right? The man that I'm married to now, we, he had a past and we were both on our deliverance, same things, deliverance yeah. path before yeah. we met each other, right? Um, and so I just keep on going back to this I will thing. Um, and so the root you know those strongholds in the in these roots that are are placed without us even knowing it in those situations like yeah there's pain yeah there's anger yeah we know this isn't right yeah we want to get out of this but you're not even aware of the the seeds yeah right and yeah. even the courage it takes to come out of that and the strength and moving forward the seeds yes right yeah so the only thing it's been my experience, and then this is my question to you, I want to hear what your experience was, is um, coming, those strongholds, right? And those seeds were only able to be uprooted by hearing the stories of the woman that came before me, just like you, right? That um, I could see, because reading it and getting to know Abraham was so distant from my situation that until women who looked like me, talked like me, right, had been through some stuff like me, yeah. started saying these, I will, I am, right? Yeah. Did I believe? And, yes. and, and in those spaces where um, the the deliverance started to happen, you know? Yeah. And I really, truly know, I know that I know that that's the charge behind this ministry that God, God's creating here with Unexpected Ministries is bringing all of us together. Yes. For the ones that are coming after us so that they can see the I am's are great. The I wills yes. are great. The scriptures yes. are great. But until yes. you see it and you feel it and it looks like you, you know, yes. those strongholds aren't being pulled down. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, walking into those relationships with these women um, with the strongholds and st still there. Yes. Right? And yes. That that happens. Yeah. So I, so, oh my God. So one of the key factors of my deliverance were women who were willing to say the hard things to me. Right. Literally, they pulled me up and out. Right. Because they were like, you're more than that. And I didn't feel like it. They got in my business. They got in my face, but with love. Mm -hmm. Right. And these were women of the church. These are women that I came into contact with. And um, I was originally I'm from California, moved to Oklahoma. California is pretty like business, like stay in your lane. Don't be crossing over. <laughs> right. Oklahoma is like, come sit on my sip for, on my porch yeah. drink some tea, and we're going to get you whole delivered. Right? right. Because they care about the core of who you are, mm -hmm. like of who I am. They cared about the core of who I was. And so what I learned very quickly was that one, my story mattered and it didn't matter that it wasn't perfected because in my first state, everything had to be perfected and you don't show any of that. You don't show any remorse. You don't yeah, cry. That's so good. Right. You don't cry. You don't show emotion. You just right. put on the mask in the face. So literally they were peeling off every mask and there were lots and lots and lots of deep layers. So in that process, the uprooting happened because it was confirmation of what God was saying. And they kept using mm -hmm. the word to say that. But they also use everyday experiences. So when I got a little place further in whatever area, they put me in position to serve somebody else right. and to help them through. And that area was really parenting. So I have some ladies I mentored who my marriage was broken failed marriage. I was still a mess, but I was telling them, Hey, here's some simple tips to do with your kids. And they're like, right. what? you're failed. Why are you telling me? So they tell the story now, like she was on point all the way through, but I was rebellious. Cause I was like, how can she tell me about my marriage? She don't know about my marriage because her marriage was broken. Right. Mm -hmm. But they put me in this position to be able to have this seed, to be able to give where I could. 
And what it did is strengthen those other areas as I kept giving out. Mm -hmm. But it also gave voice to what abuse looks like. So I hadn't connected everything in my first marriage as abuse because it was the norm, right? So it gave me a picture of what abuse looked like. And it also gave me a picture of God created your identity for a purpose. Yeah. Who has the right to change what the creator created in you? And giving away our power to somebody who didn't create it as it's not what God intended. Yeah. So in marriage, we get to stay together and bring who we are. We don't mesh into one, like one little form, more form. It's two identities that get to come together to fulfill what God has for us. And we get to support each other. Mm -hmm. And so it was never this dogmatic step on me and do what I say, but it was that I'm bringing you together for a purpose. And then we get to create what God has ordained for us to create in that, Mm -hmm. in that space and in that time. The other thing that I remember that rang true was that I was skill building with every single step, right? So that skill building is what caused me to be able to keep moving and go forward and to do those things. And with that skill, then my experience and my pathway and my all of my um, field practice now had tools that uh, were attached to it that I could then translate into the next thing that I wanted to do. Right. And so it's not a, um, I talk about in my own work, in the background of life. Right. So images in social media shows this perfected image of things but we don't know the story of how it got to be there. Mm-hmm. So what's happened in the background of life for that one image to come forward? It's, it's, it's the holiday time. What happens in the background to get that one picture for the picture for the right. Christmas card, right? <laughs> like they were screaming, they were yelling, and there were all these things. Like we missed the deadline. We got to run in the car to get like here. And then we like, cheese. Right. <laughs> so that's not the reality. That's the reality good, yeah. Are those unexpected life events that is happening that we, with the help of God, come up from, get somebody that can connect with us because my life may not be your life. Like I grew up in the church. That's not everybody's life. Mm -hmm. But every life can connect on a human aspect. This is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Let's sit down and just let's take a deep breath together. Right. Mm -hmm. And let's get one step that we're going to do for the next thing. Everybody can do that. Right. And you don't have to be perfected in order to come into my space to do that. You just have to come and then we make connections and then we move forward from there. And I think that's that's a missing element that we need to bring back into our society. Just true connection and community. Yeah, uh, because that's where we really learn. Right. And that's where we really grow. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and we save lives Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. that like. I'm I'm struggling. Maybe I'm suicidal. Um, maybe I've given up hope. I think there is no other route. And then you come along and you just smile at me and say, hey, I have an extra of this. Would you like it? And then conversation connects and then we start forward. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I was reading this morning. This isn't even what I was going to say, but you just reminded me. I was reading this morning. I can't remember the scripture, but it was talking about the very first origins of the church Mm. and how all it was (laughs) was a bunch of guys getting together, studying the apostles, right? And having some food. And if they had an extra shirt or they had an extra pair of shoes, they brought it for their brother in need. That's the origin, right? And I feel such a pull like back toward to that, you know, that that is really all God needs. (laughs) So, right. To keep on growing this, that's the kingdom he was trying to plant here. Yeah. All your icons you can keep. So I hope that we can like walk in alignment with that as we move forward in this ministry. Um, Last, did you want to say something? I was saying he keeps, um, he always is on me about creating space. Yeah. Action. Yeah. And so I, e- even in the chaos of every day, like my house and areas is a mess, laundry's there and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I always have drawn to create a space yeah. so that people could sit and connect. Right. And so like I, this, um, he told me this week, focus on one thing. Like you can't do everything, focus on one thing. 
And so each day has been one thing. So the first day it was setting my table and setting up to be inviting, right? Mm -hmm. So you see the table in the picture and it's like, oh, this is so gorgeous. You don't see all of the stuff that needs to be put away. You right. don't see, see, he said, because this is what people will focus on. And then you keep doing that. And then you create, because we try and create the ideal in every, my house, you come into every room and this is like, that's not the re reality, right? Yeah. The reality yeah. is that people need fellowship yes, and they need a space to connect. So God was like, can you create a space to connect? Mm -hmm. And so I did the table. And then I did my front and then he told me um, I had all these subscription boxes that I ordered. So they're empty boxes. He's like, fill the boxes and wrap them. And so when people come, give them a gift. And I was like, but God, it has to be perfect. And he's like, no, it'll be exactly what is needed Yeah. here. And he just told me, pull wow. some items here, pull some items here. All different things that have been sitting around my house. Right. At, you know, I don't need, I have plenty of those things, but he's like, people are coming to your house. Are you ready to come? Are you ready for them? He's like simplicity. Wow. And that's really, really been dealing with me on um, to create those moments, like you said, of connection. Mm -hmm. And in that moment you get ministered to, I can't tell mm -hmm. you how many people were looking at that post and say, I would love to create a table like that. He's mm -hmm. like, show them how. Right. And it's not exp it's not expensive. I buy my um, Christmas stuff at the end of the season, mm -hmm. so I have it for the next year. So it's like seventy five percent off. Mm -hmm. But I'll buy a whole like table set up, like placemats yeah. and all that stuff, yeah. and then I put it in in my bin and store it. And then when I bring it out, I'm like, oh my god, I have this. I forgot I had this. <laughs> right. Right. You just start creating those things, and you teach other people how. And that's where we actually start to create the life that God intends for us. Right. Showing yeah. people how, mm -hmm. um, and that his intention for the table was fellowship. He put fellowship. that on my heart. Fellowship. Yeah. Or just yeah. gather, talk about me and I'll yes. provide the bread. Right. That's it. That's <laughs> just it. Talk about me. I'll provide the bread. This table's for fellowship. I love that. Yeah. Um, and don't, don't try and overcomplicate it. Complicate it. Yeah. Right. He told me, like, figure out what you're going to serve, make a couple of trays and some cookies and hot chocolate mm -hmm. and sit. Right. I'm like, OK, I can do that. <laughs> right. right. Whatever gets them to the table. But it's what happens at the table. Yeah. He's, he's uh, yeah. concerned about. That's so good. Um, all right. I have one other thing you said. And uh, this is so good. Like my mind is just going all these other places. But I want to highlight. I don't want to let you go before I highlight the things that Holy Spirit is like prompting me to. When you were just sharing prior to this table conversation, <laughs> you I don't even know if you said it, but you said the reality is the unexpected. The reality mm -hmm. is the unexpected. And I want to just highlight that for a moment because that is absolutely one of the things that God, um, when I wrote my my book, um, he said, we, we got to change the conversation, Connie. We got to change the conversation. They, they think these are accidents. They think they're messed up. Nobody's giving me the glory here. Nothing's unexpected, right? He's like, we got to change this conversation. We got to drop that word, you know? Yes. So in most of the um, conversations I show up for in this space, I um, make sure that I correct my guests. <laughs> no, I'm not, not, it's not correction on you, but that just dropping the words of, you know, when I made a mistake, when I took a wrong turn, yeah, no, God said, no, drop that, drop that. You know, oh. there's nothing unexpected. This was all planned. The world is making you feel like yes. it was unexpected, but this has Every, been the plan the yeah. whole time. Right. So the whole reality time. is the unexpected. I'm going to put that. I think that's the title of your episode. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Because so, the reality is when we were created with the purpose, right. every, everybody, like I said, myself, right. And my children, my mom, my dad, them getting together, having three girls who we are, all of that is purposed of God. Right. And so what, what happens is that we have, like I said, that that outward facing, this is the image that we have. But then we have the reality of God, which like the hands down, this probably is a whole another episode. Hands down, he created us to be in fellowship with him. That's the first thing. Right. So he created these promises and this covenant 
to bring not it back based to him. on who we are, but based on who he is. Yes. That's the God reality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if we really centered that, think about all the things that will fall off of our lives if that really was the center. Yeah. Because right. we created, you know, now he gives us will so we get to choose whatever we want to do, right? But that choice may not be in his direct will. So the God reality is first sitting with him to say, Lord, how are we moving forward in this? Right. What are your plans and purposes for me? Mm -hmm. Immediately, the word of God shows, here's my plans and my purposes, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we center that God reality, we do, we invite whatever comes to, into our lives and we see it in a different lens and a different perspective. Right. And it's you always know, unexpected. It doesn't even always matter. Like, because we have our own agenda. Right. And we have not always asked God about what that agenda is. Mm -hmm. And so one of my prayers in the morning, I will pray is God, thank you. You know, thank you for waking me up this morning. I invite you into my day, knowing he's already there, but I invite you into my day and show me what I need to accomplish for the day. Right. right? So that just sitting down, job jotting down what he says, and then looking at it and saying, oh, we need to do X, Y, Z. And then amazingly, by the end of the day, I actually get those things done mm -hmm. and I'm set up for the next moment, for the next day, right. month, whatever, because I follow what that plan was. Right. right. But there's nothing unexpected by God. Mm -hmm. So there is on our part, because we have already crafted this ideal of what we see ourselves accomplishing and how we want it to come. Him. Yeah. Like if it was me, I was pregnant at 25, having my children, doing my career, and then here I'm finished, right? Mm -hmm. That wasn't his plan. Right. One, he needed to plant that seed in a relationship where they could flourish, right? And not be further wounded and have to go right. through deliverance like we did. Mm -hmm. Two, the timing brought restoration for myself. And for my husband, because my husband is 14 years older than me. Mm. So he gets to parent a second set of children mm. in a totally different space, right. in a delivered space. And so he gets to learn through that process and they get to benefit from this wisdom, from the settling and right. what he has to offer at that time. And we get to negate, both of us get to negate the lies that the enemy told us about our our former lives, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so those lies get to be dismantled because now here's this reality, this God reality of, whoa, you have this to offer. You're capable. Look at the children. They're thriving. You have a home. You have stability. Like this is the, this is the reality of the picture, right? We just need to be matched with who could help us to do that together, each right. other, right? Mm -hmm. With God and his timing to be able to bring that forth. Was that any of our plan? No. Was it his plan to have three wives? <laughs> no. <laughs> was it his my plan to have two husbands? No. But was it God's plan to bring these children into the earth at this specific time? Yes. Yeah. And that's how that's how he did it. So yeah. Yeah. that leads yeah. me right into my final question. And it's so good, but I just want to piggyback on what you said. Because the Holy Spirit was just like, you, 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 you got to point this out. <laughs> Is that um, uh, God's going to be God in every situation and God is unexpected, period. God is going to be who he is and God is unexpected. So if it's unexpected, you can trust God is in it. Yes. And that <laughs> his covenant for us is yes. always going to be oh. restoration. This is your words, deliverance and wholeness. Oh, yes. Every time. Suddenlies. That's what he, he said. Every he said. time. The unexpected so, are the suddenlies. Yes. Yeah. Um, you've said it a couple times, and then I want to bring it back to this final question about, you know, we both experienced these. Uh, we were walking parallel journeys to our spouses now, right? And our own deliverance, our own and our own relationship with God. And then here we are creating new families together, right? And so that that covenant and that unexpected, right, did not end with the meeting of us. 
And yeah. just as we were standing before God and say, okay, thank you. Now I got a partner in this. Now what? Mm-hmm. It, ha- it continues what, with the birth of our children, right? Okay, now I got a child. Now what? Now I'm standing right. before you with alongside, I love you said, alongside my mm-hmm. child. Now what? Right? Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing. And it's the same covenant. And it's the same restoration, right? In our relationships with our children and, and the responsibilities of growing them. I always say, I've said it a thousand times in my coaching that my baby's got his own God and it's not me. No. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> um, understanding that now, like we shared our whole journey, right? So as we stand in today, understanding that they've got their own God and it's not me. You know, what does that look like in your parenting today? You know? Oh, great question. So I am an advocate for intentional parenting. Um, With my background in early childhood, I always tell people like birth to conception to five years old, boom, got that, right? After five, (laughs) the children were driving the train, right? (laughs) Because, I well, I say eight. So after eight, the children were driving the train. But I tell I tell parents every day, you don't ever stop parenting. But we get to the point where, you know, I can, what we think about, I can manipulate the infant and how they, you know, are growing and whatnot. We think, we imagine that. Mm-hmm. The five-year-old, there's a little pushback, but I can do that, right? And then they go to school, school age, eight years old. Now, all of these outside influences are now competing with what we do as parents and whatnot. I believe centering, and this is my mandate, Mm -hmm. to restore families to the order that God intended. They Family was the first institution that God set up. And we have allowed everything else to dictate how the family operates. And that because of that, that's why the family is broken. So I'm a strong believer is that we start in our home. We start with our own values and beliefs. And as a family, we move that way. So as the boys have gotten older, we reinforce that with intentional parenting. We are aware, we're involved, we interrupt and disrupt things Uh and messages that don't align with what what we believe. And we are uh, actually learning with them as well. So we don't come off as I'm the parent. I know it all um, because that's our tendency. Like I've been here for 56 years. You need to listen to me. Like, but you're being rude. Because I said so. (laughs) And not being kind. So what are they going to hear? What you're speaking or how you're treating them? Right. And so we set those things up in our life. And so that intention looks like looking at everyone's schedule helping them to understand you, we have a schedule too. Uh-huh. So we're here, yes, to support you, but you need to be respectful. Last minute, we can't do it. So we got we got to work. We got to right. do this thing. If you want to do that thing, you got to tell us in advance and we'll talk about it. There's still rules about like who they can engage with and who not. We need to know them, know the family, know the parent, know the child. Yeah. So can I just go hang out with so-and-so? Nope. But let me meet them and let's see what that looks like. So intention every day is building in all of those things. Big thing in our household right now, because we have teenagers, is that you need to be a contributor to the household in some way. Not just a taker, give me all my needs, but you need to be a contributor and you need to make it a habit. So a habit of practices will help us to establish our household and all of us have a part in that. There's no maid service. There's no, you know, come in, hotel, leave your, like, no, your laundry, you want it wash, you got to take it to the washroom. Mm-hmm. And so that intention happens every day in simple things like that, but also in the messaging we give them. So yes, here's your goals. So how are you working towards them and how you break them down? So when the boys were little, I did, I always do goal setting and vision um, casting every year. And so the boys did theirs and theirs were do, be, go. Those were their three. And I have a little training on that. And so what do you want to do? Who do you want to be? And where do you want to go? And so they would write out their little things. I still have their flip chart from one of our sessions. Right now, they're living in that intention. They're football players, basketball players, 
Only thing I haven't delivered on was a live NFL game. So still with <laughs> that, but it's the other thing they did. And so they were like, I want to, we did the, theirs we do in the summer, but they wanted to read certain books. So they're, they're book readers. Like most kids don't read books. Right. And so those were intentions that we put into their lives so that they would foster that as they grow up. Mm-hmm. So everyday intentions, um, it matters and we have to build that in. So our A to Z parenting community and membership, that's what that speaks to. So we have these intention cards for every um, age and stage, even wow. for um, emptiness, college bound. Like, so we have those for every stage. Wow. Good stuff. Can you tell our listeners how they can get involved? And we're going to put it in your description too, but um, how they can get involved with that program. Yes. So if you want to go to our um, site at developpeople.org and join our mailing list so you can stay up to date. And specifically, when you join the mailing list, you'll have an option for A to Z parenting. Um, Connect with that one and then we'll send you the information for the membership when it comes out in January 2023. Very timely work. Very timely work. God is restoring the family unit for sure. I feel it. Thank you so much. This has been so powerful. I mean, there was so much I pulled out of this conversation for, um, I feel like so many stages of the process, right? Just the story of unexpected pregnancy and what that full picture looks like. Yeah. And going, because you got to go back to your own, you got to go back to your own childhood, right? And all that life experience that got you to this point. And then you have to look at where actually am I, right? And then how do we keep moving forward? And like you said, nothing is unexpected because God has purposed and planned our lives. That's right. The reality is unexpected. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us. It's been such an honor to have this conversation with you and hold this space together. Thank you. Um, Will you do me the honor of praying us out as we close today? I will. God, we just thank you for this fellowship and for the intentionality of your plan. We know that the vision that you have given Connie is a vision that is a collective vision, but you have put her at the helm to carry it forward. So we just speak blessings over Connie, over her household, her husband, her family, that as they foster this work, that you would continually guide them with more innovation for the resources to get it done. And for every, that they would always keep in mind, God, every person that they will touch, not only the one mom that calls, but the trickle down effect of that one mom and touching her life touches her children, her children's children, her circles, her community. So let them understand the exponential growth and impact of what they're doing. And so God, we thank you that you have allowed us to steward this work. Help us to always hear you and to listen and to obey to the T what you have spoken for us, because we understand the residual effect of that obedience. And so God continue to cover us in our minds, our hearts, and our emotions. And as we go through the season that we stay open to what you're speaking and saying and how you're bringing us together. And we speak this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Life Unexpected podcast cannot thank you enough for spending your time here with us today. If you know of anyone that can benefit from the resources shared with you here, Please share this out. Absolutely subscribe and join us here again next Wednesday. If you're interested in supporting our ministry, just head on over to any of the social media platforms and look for Unexpected Ministries. Um, You can find resources there and head on over to Kindle and Amazon to purchase your copy of um, You're Not Disqualified. And we continue to... um, Pray for you and your situations and in your families too. Thank you so much for joining us today. God bless. You are listening to Do Your Worldwide Podcast.